The Straw Hats have changed a lot. We've had Usopp on his journey to become a brave warrior of the sea, Chopper embracing his inner monster, and even Robin finding a family with her newfound Nakama. But while all of these are a lot more well-known pieces of character development, some of the Straw Hats' growth in power and character has been so subtle that many fans didn't even fully understand many of the most important characters in all of One Piece. And of course, the perfect example here is our favorite swordsman, Roronoa Zoro. On the surface, you might think that he really hasn't changed all that much, but you'd be dead wrong about that. I mean, ever since he and his childhood friend Kuina promised each other to become the world's strongest swordsman slash woman, I guess, he's been dead set on achieving that single goal his entire life. And yeah, that goal hasn't changed at all. But what you might not know or have realized is that since the very first time that we met him until now, Zoro has almost completely changed his entire inner motivations. Don't believe me? Well, let's start at the beginning here, because when we first meet Zoro back in chapter 3 of the story, he's basically the stereotypical swordsman type character. He's very powerful, confident, and basically a lone wolf. He loves nothing more than fighting, drinking, sleeping, and working out. And he really only ends up joining Luffy's crew so that he can progress on his own dream of becoming the world's greatest swordsman. And to be completely honest here, Zoro is one of the few straw hats and in general characters in One Piece who actually represents much more of a perfect ideal than they actually represent a real person or character. And what I mean by that is that he's basically a macho man who's also always extremely cool and this is reflected in his very early designs with his intimidating bandana, memorable sash, and his unique three sword style of fighting. As a result, without any doubt, Zoro is and remains to this day one of the coolest characters in all of anime. And we can basically also say that Zoro is pretty much the only straw hat who didn't need to make some life-changing decision or be metaphorically saved by Luffy to join the crew. All he really needed was for Luffy to, well, literally untie him from this post, which was the start of the greatest partnership the world has ever seen seen since the former Pirate King Roger set out with his right-hand man, Silver's Rayleigh. So yeah, that is all the basics and probably pretty much what you already knew about Zoro. But what you might not realize is that while he didn't really need to change to join the crew, Zoro's adventure with the Straw Hats itself actually changed him the most out of almost any other crewmate. And this journey of Zoro's transformation kicked off when he was embarrassed by the world's actual strongest swords Dracul Mihawk during the Barate arc. Because basically, up to this point in the story, Luffy and Zoro had seemed basically unbeatable as they took down small-time pirates left and right. In fact, you might remember that Zoro even believed at this point that he did actually stand a real chance against Mihawk, which honestly is just really hilarious looking back on it. So being humbled like he was truly showed Zoro exactly how far he still had to go to actually come even close to becoming the world's strongest swordsman. And now, as I said before, Zoro really only originally joined Luffy to pursue his own goals, but all of that started to change during the Arlong Park arc when Zoro first saw Luffy's willingness to actually die for his friends. Because in the end, Luffy didn't need to go and save Nami. In fact, there was plenty of reasons to just leave her alone since she pretty much betrayed the crew and everything, but because Luffy tried so hard to save his friend that he believed in, Zoro actually started to believe that Luffy was a captain worthy of following. And of course, early on in the story, these are very important character moments for Zoro, but you might be surprised to hear that out of everyone in the crew, it is Zoro who actually first shows signs of unlocking the secret power of the One Piece world. And yes, we're actually talking about hockey right now. For example, during his fight with with this blade man, Zoro is able to hear the breath of all things, which might have been his very first step in awakening observation hockey. But what's even crazier is that this was basically confirmed later during the Skypiea arc when he took down this winged swordsman by sensing him through a solid wall. So yeah, even 
though Luffy is supposed to be the hockey prodigy, it was actually Zoro showing us the very first signs of hockey all along inside the crew. But of course, this is not his only development because the next major character moment for Zoro came during the heartbreaking Water 7 duel between Luffy and Usopp. Because throughout all the tension between the beloved captain and sniper, Zoro was one of the few in the crew who actually put his foot down and said that if Usopp was actually going to disrespect the crew and the captain, then he did in fact need it to leave. In fact, he ended up delivering one of the most impactful lines of all time when he said that Luffy protecting the honor of the crew is a burden of being the captain. And this moment also really showed us that Zoro now felt that his own personal honor was actually directly tied to that of Luffy and the crew, which demonstrates that he now sees himself as less of an individual and more as a real part of this group. And in fact, this idea was then fully cemented in the next arc when he had one of the greatest moments in all of One Piece. Because first, he got a truly ridiculous katana upgrade when he was given the sword of the legendary Wano Samurai Ryuma, one of his ancestors, but on top of that, we also had this. And damn, I mean, if you had thought to this point that Zoro was only living for himself, then this moment grabbed that idea, crushed it into a little ball, set it on fire, and then blasted it into space. Like seriously, this famous moment truly proved to us and to the rest of the crew that Zoro 100% put Luffy's life above his own. But more than that, he also believed so strongly in Luffy's dream that he was willing to give up his very own dream in order to help Luffy achieve his own. Which, when you really think about it, is a truly unthinkable change from Zoro's mindset when we first met him and when he first joined Luffy. And then to cap it all off, Zoro doubled down on his ideals by begging Mihawk to train him during the time skip, which is yet another gigantic moment of humility from Zoro. And if you don't quite know what I mean by this, it's simply because once again, he's showing that he's willing to lay down his own pride and honor, crawling down in front of Mihawk in order to get stronger for his crew and captain. And honestly, Zoro changing from being a true lone wolf chasing his dream to someone that will put the dreams of his crew before his own is one of the most profound arcs in the entire story that I think a lot of people missed. And then after the time skip, Zoro's development has been a lot more on the power side as he's continued to learn the different forms of hockey. Design-wise, he somehow lost or chose to close one of his eyes, which we still don't really know anything about. And on top of that, his growth came to a massive climax during Wano when he gained the legendary sword Enma, which really helped him master the ultimate form of hockey, advanced conquerors. Which with all of that combined, leaves Zoro as one of the most powerful characters in the entire story at this point, and certainly one of the coolest characters in all of anime history. And on that same level as Zoro, when our next Straw Hat was introduced, she was immediately an absolute 10 out of 10 in terms of awesome characters. Because with her sick western cowgirl outfits and terrifying devil fruit abilities, Nico Robin instantly became one of the most exciting characters in the entire story story during the Alabasta Saga. However, soon after we learned the heartbreaking truth that lay beneath her harsh exterior, which was a girl who had been abused and abandoned basically her entire life. Because as we later on learned, Nico Robin was left behind by her parents, neglected by her relatives, and then later on lost everyone that she loved and cared for during the tragedy of Ohara, which basically led her to a soul-crushing 20 years of survival on the run from the government, which brings us to the Straw Hats finally meeting her in Alabasta, where she was already a master of her Hana Hana Devil Fruit that basically allows her to sprout extra body parts and use them in combat. And honestly, it still gives me kind of uncomfortable chills still every time that Robin literally snaps someone's back using her clutch technique. That stuff is really, oof, I mean, you know what I mean. But her Devil Fruit is not even her most important ability because of course, while in Alabasta, we also learned that Robin could 
could actually read the legendary Poneglyphs, which are these giant stones that tell the story of the Void Century. And this, of course, ties into her true dream to learn the real history that she inherited from her mom and the beloved scholars of Ohara. And of course, that is exactly why she decided to snuck onto the Straw Hat ship at the end of the Alabasta arc. And even though Luffy surprisingly actually let her join the Straw Hats, Robin still had a very, very long way to go before she fully embraced being part of the crew. Part of that was, of course, because after her traumatic childhood, she didn't really see herself as worthy of friends. In fact, during the Skypea arc, she basically only referred to the crew by their titles, such as calling Luffy simply Captain and Nami the Navigator, which showed to us and the other Straw Hats that she didn't really see herself as part of the group yet. But all of that, of course, changed in a truly massive way during the Water 7 and Ennis lobby arc. Because as we saw firsthand, Robin is still being hunted by the world government. In fact, this admiral almost took out the entire Straw Hat crew because she was traveling with them. And then she was kidnapped by the world government secret agent CP9. And as we learned a little bit later, she was willing to actually sacrifice herself so the rest of the crew could actually go free. Which, you know, on the surface, at least shows us that she actually cared about others, but deep down, it also highlights an even bigger problem that she had. And for that, let's quickly go back to this moment in Alabasta, because here, Luffy had just been thrashed by the Warlord Crocodile and had to actually be saved by Robin in order to not die. And even though Luffy, of course, eventually defeated Crocodile, I think Robin still didn't truly believe and trust in the abilities of the Straw Hats. She kind of felt that in the end, they would still abandon her just like everyone else had done in her life. Which is, of course, why this moment was so incredibly powerful and remains many fans and honestly mine too absolute favorite moments in the entire story. Because here, Robin finally, finally accepted that this crew would never abandon her and she embraced their will to save her for the very first time. And honestly, wow, what an insane change that brought. Because while Robin had gone along quietly with the government agents up to this point, now she suddenly started fighting and clawed the whole way, even literally biting the ground to keep from being taken away. And honestly, how awesome was this when you saw it for the first time? I mean, she was fighting for her friends just like they were fighting for her. Which now takes us past Anna's lobby and really the rest of the story where Robin finally believes in her own self-worth and that of her crew. And we can even see this reflected in the way that she now dresses as before this point, she mostly wore pretty sharp, intimidating clothes and after this event, she is much more relaxed and casual. And we even see her enjoying her coffee and reading while traveling together with the crew. Now, a little bit unfortunately though, there hasn't been a ton of development for Robin ever since this insane moment. To be fair, she did get to train with the Revolutionary Army during the time skip and learn Fishman Karate along with improved control of her devil fruits. In fact, after the time skip, she can now actually make giant versions of her limbs to stomp opponents, grow wings to to even fly and even be able to create full body clones to use for spying. But even though her character has not really been developed that much since the time skip, believe me when I tell you that Robin has the most mouth-watering future of any character in the story. Because let's be real, with her knowledge of the Poneglyphs, she is basically the most important character in order to find the One Piece. Which means that she is sure to play a major role in the final saga and if that wasn't enough, we might even get to learn the secrets that her parents die protecting, see her prove her worth to this guy, and at the very end of the story, hopefully, witness her final confrontation with taking down the world government that had ruined her entire life. And pff, wow, that was a lot of information about just two of the most in-depth straw hats. So now for a little bit of a breather, let's actually move on to a crewmate who is a little bit more straightforward. And that's because Frankie here was, is, and always will be, Super! That's right, our favorite cyborg is a man who really 
hasn't changed a lot since uh, we first met him back on Water 7. Sure, I mean, he has gone from a mostly human cyborg to a mostly cyborg human, but he can still shoot fire, launch missiles, you know, blast bullets, and most importantly, change the style of his hair. Really, the only major difference from when we first met him to now is that now everything is just a lot stronger than he does. Oh, yeah, and uh, he's also got this super cool mech and some other cool toys like this motorcycle, which are pretty awesome, I have to say. But just because Frankie hasn't changed much, of course, doesn't mean that he isn't really awesome. Because one of Frankie's greatest character traits is that he basically breaks the stereotype of a typical macho man. I mean, yeah, sure, he's loud, buff, a little bit of a pervert, loves building weapons and cars and stuff, but we've also seen him cry quite a lot, embrace his weird side, and most importantly, Frankie openly shows affection for his friends and family. Family. Now, to be fair, most of these traits were already part of his character when we first met him, but the one thing that Frankie is still chasing is to have one of his own ships travel around the entire world. And you see, all of this actually ties back to his tragic past, because as a child, Frankie's inventions were part of the reason that his father figure was killed in the first place. In case you forgot, that's because a young Frankie used to just build the biggest, most destructive weapons that he could just because he thought it was pretty cool. But then he had to learn the really hard way that those weapons could actually be used against innocent people, and since then he needed to learn to take responsibility for the thing that he actually creates. Which is also why Frankie's future character development might involve the most dangerous weapon on this planet, and that's of course because Frankie was entrusted with the blueprints for a weapon that could counter one of the all-powerful ancient weapons, Pluton. And while we now know that that particular ancient weapon is actually hiding underneath the country of Wano, someday Frankie may have to decide whether it's right or not to build a weapon capable of destroying entire islands. You know, unless he has already integrated that into the Sunny. But while Frankie is going to have to face that major decision someday, Usopp started out with a much, much scarier decision. Because as we all know, Usopp was a massively scared cat. So his decision to actually leave his home island after the Strahds helped save the village is already a huge step on his character journey. And let's be real, out of all the Straw Hats, Usopp is and always has been easily the most relatable for any fan. And that's because he isn't a superhuman fighter with a devil fruit or other super crazy abilities. No, he's just a boy with a slingshot who dreams of becoming a brave warrior of the sea. Just like many of us, I might add. And it is his progress towards this goal that makes Usopp one of the Straw Hats with the most noticeable character development in the entire story. Because Usopp went basically from this to this. And this moment after the time skip is actually super important because his visual changes really highlight his growth as a character as well. Early in the story, you see, he always wore these large overalls, but post time skip, he is much more confident in showing off his new manly buffness. And on top of just the visual changes, we also saw time and time again that Usopp had to confront his crippling fears and overcome his weaknesses in order to help the crew. For example, he sacrificed himself for the crew during his fight on Alabasta. And honestly, not only Alabasta, basically in each and every arc, it seems like Usopp gets beaten up so badly and yet he still continued to do his best to keep up with the crew. However, underneath the surface, Usopp was about to break. Because for basically the entire pre-timeskip journey, Usopp was not only fighting to keep up with the crew, but also fighting to convince himself that he deserved to even be a part of the crew in the first place. And of course, this all came to a head during the Water 7 arc, because when Luffy decided to get a new ship, Usopp's heart broke. Because to him, Luffy's choice to move on to a better ship was also a stab in his own heart because he thought that maybe at some point Luffy would get rid of him someday as well to replace him with someone better. And so, of course, as we all know, Usopp and Luffy had their truly fateful duel and Usopp ended up leaving the crew. Which was just so, so heartbreaking on so many levels and the first real moment in the entire story when the crew was on the verge of breaking 
picking up. However, of course, Usopp's departure also cleared then the way for Soge King, also known as the King of Snipers, to then join the crew during their attempt to rescue Robin. And while using his alter ego character, Usopp showed everyone exactly why he is such an important part of the crew. First, with his upgraded Kabuto slingshot, he landed the most epic snipe in the entire story when he saved Robin from being dragged across the bridge and then, just when Luffy was about to be defeated by this government secret agent, Usopp's inspiring speech gave Luffy the final push that he needed to finish the fight. So yeah, in many ways, Usopp is truly irreplaceable because of his unshakable desire to help the crew and his unique skills that literally no one else in the crew can provide. And speaking of any of those skills, we have not yet mentioned Usopp's other main ability, which is of course his skills as a tinkerer. You see, because Usopp is so clever at making things, he has upgraded his own slingshot many many times, going from launching rocks and eggs with this, to shooting off fireballs, plant-based projectiles, and even terror-inducing special bullets. On top of that, of course, he has also upgraded Nami's climb attack multiple times, taking it from a basic staff with a few tricks, to a full-on weather-controlling super weapon. And for Usopp, there is a clear path ahead in the story as well. I mean, clearly, he's already become a brave warrior of the sea in his own rights, but deep down, I still think that Usopp still needs to convince himself that this is truly real. And of course, there is no better place for that to happen than the island of Elbaf, home of the giants, where Usopp is sure to play a massive role due to his former friendships with the giants. And now, while Usopp may one day lie his way to be the king of the giants, there is actually one straw hat who can quite literally become a giant. And that is, of course, Tony Tony Chopper, whose early struggles with accepting his complicated identity are a vital part of his character development. Because when we first met Chopper on Drum Island, he had gone through an incredibly tragic past. First, he was cast out by his own herd of reindeer because he ate a devil fruit that turned him into a human. And then he was thrown out by the humans like he was some kind of monster. But after befriending this quack doctor here, Chopper then went on to accidentally poison the only friend that he ever had, leaving him alone and isolated in the world once again. And while he was eventually taken in by another old doctor, his whole past has understandably left Chopper with quite conflicted feelings about himself. But that's of course when the Straw Hats came along, and Luffy basically drags Chopper out of his hole so that he can actually go join the crew. However, Chopper's character arc isn't quite done yet, because deep inside he still views himself as some sort of freak and monster. I mean, sure, he has got some really weird forms such as his human form, which looks like an oddly shaped human, and this form called Guard Point, in which Chopper becomes a big fluff ball. But underneath all of his other pre-time skip forms, Chopper is hiding a very dark secret. Because with his medical skills, Chopper actually invented a drug that boosts his own devil fruit powers. The danger though is that if he takes too many of these bite-sized drugs at the same time, Chopper becomes a nearly unstoppable, mindless giant monster. And in this form, he gains incredible size and power, but the downside is that he literally cannot control himself. And honestly, from a character perspective, this is just the perfect embodiment of Chopper's inner conflict. Deep down, there was a real monster hiding, and Chopper could not control it when his friends needed him the most. And that's not to say that Chopper had actually a sad ending though, because after the time skip, Chopper has both learned to control his monster point, and most importantly, he has accepted who he actually is. Because in his mind, yeah, he is a monster, but one that he will gladly embrace as long as he can protect his friends who do not care about that at all. And that was a real deep dive into Chopper's inner psyche, but it is honestly one of the most powerful character arcs from the early parts of the story. But that's of course not the only change that Chopper went through though, because this adorable reindeer had many, many other negative traits that he has since grown out of. For one, Chopper has always been a little bit of a coward as well, kind of like Usopp, which 
makes sense since he is technically the youngest Straw Hat. But he was also really easily tricked and incredibly naive to the point that he would basically believe anything that anyone would tell him. After the time skip though, Chopper has now gotten a lot wiser and while he can still be fooled, he is much harsher with people who do bad things. If you want a good example, when this evil scientist used drugs to run terrible experiments on children, Chopper went truly ballistic and wanted to curse the gassy scientist with the worst fate imaginable. However, that also brings us to the next part of Chopper's character, which is his incredible skills as a doctor. And while he's of course always been a top tier healer, Chopper has gotten much, much closer to his dream of being able to cure basically any disease thanks to his new experiences traveling with the crew and what happened during the time skip. This includes visiting isolated islands to learn herbal healing, working with scientists to invent new types of medicines, and of course spending countless hours healing the crew from all types of injuries. Oh, and of course he's also gotten a lot stronger because in addition to learning to just control his monster point, Chopper can now combine forms like arms and jump point to create Kung Fu Point. We also met a completely different side of Chopper when he first met the Animal Minx on Zo, and he flexed his doctor magic by healing the ice only plagues in Wano. And so the only thing that's really left to see with Chopper's story is what kind of conditions he will need to heal in the future. For example, many people expect that Luffy at some point will come down with a life-threatening illness, very much like the former Pirate King Goldie Roger did. And so we will really have to wait and see if Chopper can cure something like that before the end of the story. His whole character arc started basically back when Luffy saved Chopper though, but there has been no clearer moment of Luffy saving someone than when he freed Nami from her slavery during the All Along Park arc. And those two major themes are really what Nami's story has been all about. Slavery and freedom. Because she was locked into basically slavery as a kid and forced to draw maps for Arlong, yet at the same time, she embodies freedom because the navigational maps allowed her to freely sail the seas. And so by the time that Luffy came around and literally freed her from Arlong's grasp, she was all set and ready to bring her maps and freedom to the world. However, Nami has also faced many other obstacles along the way, with the first and most noticeable being that she is a very weak fighter. And sure, she is very clever and can trick people better than almost anyone, but when it comes down to a straight up fight one versus one, she is almost always at a disadvantage. Which is of course why the development of her climatech weapon is so, so crucial to her story, because with its evolution from basically no more than a party trick to a full-fledged weapon of destruction, Nami can now actually utilize her knowledge of weather science to defeat enemies that are way, way stronger than herself physically. Which is of course exactly what we've been seeing in Alabasta, then Ennis Lobby, and all the way up through Wano, where she has come through in the clutch to defeat strong opponents and save her friends. And uh, speaking of saving people, Nami had a similar major character arc during the adventures in Fishman Island. And that's because it was here that she came face to face with the exact opposite of the slavery that she experienced growing up. Because here, instead of a group of evil fishmen, and slaving a group of innocent humans, here we got to see that humans have actually forced the entire fishman race to live under the ocean. But also during this arc, we could see that Nami eventually made complete peace with the fishman people for what they had done to her in the past. And honestly, that has been most of her character development, at least in the story so far. I mean, obviously there have been other things such as the sign changes, but you might actually be surprised to hear that there may be more in store for Nami's future than you might actually actually think. Because similar to Nami, Sanji had a pretty straightforward character arc during the East Blue and we all thought that this was his one Sanji centric arc. But fast forward to post time skip and Sanji got another way bigger focused arc during the entire Whole Cake Island story. And honestly, let's be real, Nami's past as a kid is just as hidden as Sanji's. For example, we don't know basically anything about Nami's biological parents or the island that she was born on, and so theoretically at least, it's still very much possible that Nami's secret past plays more of a role in the future as she continues her dream of drawing a map of the entire world. And fittingly, similar to Nami, our favorite musical skeleton's dream also very much involves sailing all the way around the globe. That's because when we first met Brooke in the spooky fog of the floor,
Florian Triangle, we soon learned that he was a long lost friend of this giant whale who the Straw Hats met right at the beginning of the Grand Line. And of course, Brooke wants nothing more than to be finally reunited with Laboon, which will likely only happen once the Straw Hats make it all the way around the world at the end of the story. But let's start at the beginning here though, because when the Straw Hats first encountered Brooke, he was trapped in more ways than just one. Obviously, he was physically trapped because his shadow had been stolen by a nearby warlord, but he was also mentally and more importantly emotionally trapped by the death of his beloved crew and his isolation for the past 50 years. And so when the Straw Hats arrived and brought some much, much needed light to the skeleton's depressing life, it really freed Brooke in more ways than just one. And of course, he was literally the perfect addition to the group because of his musical talents, because in case you forgot, a musician was one of the very first things that Luffy wanted as part of his crew. However, Brooke, of course, isn't just carried by the crew because he actually is a quite strong swordsman. And of course, we simply must talk about his devil fruit, which allowed his soul to return to his dead body. But after the time skip, he even learned how to master his full devil fruits capabilities even more. In fact, he can now let his soul roam around freely to do some secret scouting and his devil fruit also adds an icy chill that can coat his sword and everything that he touches in his environment. That's not all though, because he can even use his tremendous soul powers to overwhelm the soul of weaker beings, such as the homies from Whole Cake Islands. And just like many of the other older characters on the crew though, he hasn't really needed a ton of personal development since then. He was already a soldier and a pirate in the past, so he really knows how to be part of a team. And his goal simply involves seeing an old friend again. Now that's of course not to say that he won't play a massive role in the future though, since music and whales do have a significant tie to the One Piece treasure. And of course, there's also the quite legitimate question of if Brooke can actually die like ever. So we do have to ask how he might feel if he ever faces the reality of losing a crew for the second time, whether from battle, disease, or just old age. Plus, let me just throw out there that I would love to see some sort of adventure in an underworld type of setting where Brooke's devil fruit could truly shine the most. On the other side of things though, one of Brooke's least appealing traits, to me at least, is his pervertedness, which is shared by this next straw hat. And that is of course the one and only Vin Smoke Sanji, whose growth in this particular area still leaves quite a lot to be desired. At least he's not nearly dying from nosebleeds anymore at the sight of a pretty girl's face like he used to after the time skip, but still. Sanji is still very much way over the top in his obsession with pretty women for many fans. And that is basically the one downside to Sanji's character, because starting when we first meet him, the Straw Hat Chef is extremely kind towards anyone who deserves it, and oftentimes even those who don't. Over and over he's shown that he's willing to sacrifice himself for others, and besides the lewdness, he is also a quite mature person. That's of course not even considering his exceptional fighting and tactical skills as well. In fact, one of the best things about his addition to the crew is that he would do things that no other Straw Hat would even think of, such as sneak off to fulfill some secret mission while the rest of the crew is in danger. But of course, this can be both really good and really bad, but on the whole, it has helped the crew out on many occasions, such as when they needed to escape the Buster Call on Ennis Lobby. But of course, we also have to talk about Sanji's other major character flaw, which is of course his twisted sense of chivalry. And specifically, I'm of course talking about him refusing to hit any woman, which while it might seem admirable on the surface, really just puts the rest of his friends in danger many times, like we saw perfectly illustrated during the fight against the government secret agents on Ennis Lobby. Because instead of fighting this bubbly evil woman and getting the key to saving Robin, Sanji instead let himself be defeated, which meant that Nami had to step up and take his place. So to summarize, Sanji was not willing to fight one clearly very evil woman, but he would instead put his his own female friends in even bigger danger. So yeah, there's a lot of positives about his attitude toward women, but early in the story, it really did a lot more harm than it did.
it good. But of course, that changes in a big, big way later on. But before we get to that part, we have to recognize also that over time, Sanji has had to let go of his need to always be the hero. Because this characteristic had been part of his character forever, as he even stayed to help his mentor Zeph because he kind of felt he owned a debt to the old pirate cook. However, things started to change when Luffy took down the pirates threatening his floating restaurant home and Sanji actually joined the crew, but as we'll see, it wasn't fully resolved until way, way later in the story. I'm talking like 800 chapters later, because when Sanji left the crew during the Zo arc, he was doing so once again out of this twisted sense of responsibility and personal conflict. First off, the Emperor Big Mom was threatening Zeph, and Sanji once again felt responsible to save the old cook, which is great, but Sanji still showed his fatal flaw here because he felt that he needed to do this on his own. I mean, he even went so far as to crush Luffy to try to get Luffy to give up on rescuing himself. Now, of course, eventually that all changed when Sanji finally accepted that he didn't have to do all of this on his own and just like Nami and Robin, finally realized that Luffy would never think about giving up on trying to help him. Now, we haven't really mentioned his traumatic childhood at all, but I mean, talk about insane family drama. Because after the only person who really cared about him died, he was abused, bullied, and abandoned because he had too much human emotion in him. And even after all that though, when Sanji finally once again came face to face with his family as an adult, he showed them that he was still proud of who he was and despite everything that they did to him, beating him up, locking him in a literal dungeon with his horrific mask, and even completely disowning him that he still wouldn't see them being killed. And that was honestly a huge moment for Sanji and it showed them just how strong, mature and human that he truly was. You know, just kind of throw that point back in their faces. But at this point, he recognized that he could really fully rely on his crew and that showed up in even bigger ways during the climactic battles of the Wano arc. Because just like in Ennis Lobby, Sanji came face to face with a woman that he simply refused to kick. However, this time, instead of breaking his personal code or allowing himself to be defeated, Sanji actually called out to Robin for help because he trusted that she could do what he could not. And then that was a truly powerful moment for Sanji fans, but it was actually not the only important development that the Straw Hat Chef got in Wano. And that's because we haven't mentioned Sanji's powers yet, but by this point you should probably know that Sanji fights only with his legs. And throughout the story, he's actually learned powers to enhance this fighting style, such as his Diablo Jamba, which literally sets his leg on fire, and Haki, of course, to improve his fighting even further. But it wasn't until the end of Wano that we finally learned the real secret to Sanji's strength. You see, Sanji and his siblings were genetically modified to be stronger, but what we didn't know was that Sanji's DNA was mixed with a special race known as the Lunarians. Now, these Lunarians are basically basically gods with extremely powerful bodies as well as access to fire powers. So that explains the fiery kicks, but on top of the genetic modifications, Sanji's technologically advanced family also has developed the raid suits to further enhance these powers even more. And for a while, Sanji actually did use his raid suit to increase his speed, strength, and even gain invisibility. But by the end of the Wano arc, Sanji finally rejected this technology and decided to fight just using his his own personal strength. And what's really funny about this development though is that the more Sanji tries to actually rely on his friends and not just himself, the more success he actually starts having with women and the more powerful he also gets. In fact, both of these women had basically fallen in love with him by the end of Whole Cake Island and the Wano arc. And while Sanji had the most development out of any straw hat, I think, that doesn't mean that there isn't more to come. Of course, he needs to fulfill his dream by finding the mythical all blue, but there might also be situations where he still needs to question his chivalry once again. For example, what if he is in a scenario where refusing to fight one woman will result in another woman's death? Now, I don't really know yet what he would actually do there, and that is a little bit of character development that could still happen in the future. Which now actually brings me to the most recent Straw Hat member, which is the Knight of the Sea and former warlord, Jimbei. And while Jimbei basically has the lead evolution among any of the Straw Hats for being there the least amount of time, that doesn't mean that he didn't change dramatically in order to
to actually join the crew. Because when we first met Jinbei, he was still a former warlord who was locked up with Luffy's childhood friend Ace. And throughout this entire introduction arc, his jailbreak with Luffy, and all the events that happened at Marineford, we got to see firsthand just how insanely awesome Jinbei is as a person and as a character. He is powerful, loyal, and extremely brave, and willing to put everything on the line in order to help the people he cares for. And while we all wanted Jinbei to join the crew really badly, and Luffy even officially asked him at the end of the Fishman Island arc, the former captain of the Sun Pirates didn't actually join the crew until halfway through Wano. So a uh, very much a long time coming addition, but since Jinbei is already so powerful, mature, and skilled, the only thing that he really needed from Luffy was for the Straw Hats to come save his home island and people from themselves. Because that's of course exactly what happened, as Luffy defeated the new Fishman Pirates and the arc ended with this hugely symbolic scene of Jinbei offering up his blood to help save Luffy's life. And throughout all of this, Jinbei is basically a parallel to Nami, because whereas Nami was enslaved by fishmen growing up, Jinbei's entire people have been forced to live at the bottom of the ocean and taken as slaves by humans so that they aren't going to be subject to racism and persecutions by humans on the surface. And now while Jinbei has tirelessly worked to improve human fishman relations, his life with humans has always been stained with blood. In fact, during his own time with the original Sun Pirates, Jinbei followed the legendary fishman Fisher Tiger. And during that time, he witnessed firsthand the true cruelty of humans who eventually killed his captain. And yet, instead of wanting revenge, Jinbei just wanted to save his people. And this loyalty was so great that he eventually even joined the world government as a warlord so that they would offer some sort of protection to the entire fishman kingdom. So yeah, joining the organization that caused all the suffering for your entire people to kind of reduce it is a serious sacrifice right there. But once Luffy actually saved his kingdom and Jinbei took care of all of his obligations, the expert helmsman finally joined up with the crew. And honestly, at this point, I don't think anyone would argue that there is a more loyal member of the crew than he is. Of course, he's working towards the day when his people can finally once again live on the surface and he will be a really big part of bringing that symbolic dawn to the people as well. Which, of course, now brings us to Luffy. And if you listen to some internet trolls, you may have heard that Luffy has absolutely zero character development all throughout One Piece. And you know, in some ways at least, they might be onto something. Luffy has always represented an ideal. He has represented freedom. He's fearless, trustworthy, and will always try to help his friends and people in need. So he hasn't needed to change in those areas at all. And so kind of similar to Zoro, he's a sort of unrealistic ideal to strive towards in that sense. However, Luffy still has had to grow a ton in many other areas. With of course the most clear area for growth being how to be a better captain. Because as we've seen countless times throughout the story, Luffy's first instinct is to solve most problems with his fists, but that has gotten the crew into trouble more times than not. And even in the recent arcs, Luffy will still cause massive problems by barging into a fight head on first instead of stopping to think things through a little bit. A perfect example of this is Luffy's first encounter with Kaido during Wano, because after the blue dragon blasted through a mountain, Luffy assumed that his friends had been killed and charged right in to challenge the Emperor. Now this of course led to a massive defeat and Luffy was then thrown in jail for a third of the entire arc. However, if instead he had gone to actually challenge check on his friends, he would have seen that they were perfectly okay. So yeah, even in these later parts of the story, Luffy still has some growing to do. That's not going to say though that he hasn't gone through a lot of change so far, because there have been moments throughout the story where he has had to learn a really harsh lesson on leadership. Probably the earliest of these being this scene here from Drum Island, because here the crew is just arriving on the island with Nami suffering from a deadly illness. And so when the island citizens start shooting at the crew, Luffy wants to jump straight up into a fight. However, the Alabaster Princess BB makes him stop because she realizes that if they should fight, then they probably won't get Nami the help that she so desperately needs. And Luffy of course quickly understands this as well and bows his head
internet in order to ask for help for his navigator. And this is actually only the first clear example of Luffy still having a long way to go in terms of effectively leading his crew. And yet another example of his developing leadership is this bar scene in Jaya when Luffy, Zoro, and Nami were mocked and had food thrown all over them. And let me tell you, Child Luffy, or heck, even East Blue Luffy would have jumped straight into a fight and wiped out all of these weak pirates, but with his slow growth in maturity, Luffy now understands what Shanks tried to teach him back in chapter one, which is that some fights are just not worth it. Which Luffy makes it even more difficult when there was one fight that he just couldn't avoid. And this was without a doubt the hardest choice that he ever had to make. And that is of course when Usopp disrespected him and the crew and Luffy understood after Zoro told him so that he simply must stick up for himself, which ends up in one of the most heartbreaking moments in all of One Piece. Because as we all know, Luffy beat down Usopp and then the crew left their friend behind as well. And as we all know, this moment clearly was really, really hard for Luffy. In fact, it was ridiculously painful as we see in this moment here. But as Zoro points out quite rightly, I think, making these kinds of difficult choices are the burden of the captain and he can never doubt himself or the crew will fall apart. Now, of course, Usopp would later on rejoin the crew, but at this point, we simply have to mention how ridiculously powerful Luffy has become after all this time. But it really wasn't until Enna's lobby and the fight against the world government that Luffy unveiled his first major power up with his gear second and third technique. Now, of course, this ability vastly increases Luffy's speed and strength, but as we'll see later on, it's also the first step in making his powers a lot more serious and deadly. And to cap it all off, he also shows the serious side of his nature right after the gear second moment by declaring war on the entire world government, which basically was the first major step as a player on the world's political stage. And this entire conflict ended with another major step as he unleashed his giant sized gear third attack to help take down his first major world government enemy. However, there was no greater world stage than Marineford and it was during this epic conflict and the chapters leading up to it that Luffy fully realized that he was helplessly undermatched even when it came to fighting against the world's strongest foes. I mean, he was literally powerless in Saba Odi, nearly died in Impel Down, and then the most agonizing moment, he lost his childhood friend and brother at the hands of the Marine Admiral. So yeah, man, such a cruel series of lessons that he had to learn the hard way, but ones that were definitely necessary for Luffy to achieve his dreams and start taking things a lot more seriously. Which of course brings us to the time skip where Luffy truly evolved into a powerhouse fighter. For one, he of course learned hockey and developed his gear four forms, but he also gained the confidence to truly declare himself as a force in the new worlds. First, he claimed Fishman Island as his territory. Then he continued to take down the warlords in Dressrosa, which was just the first step in challenging the actual emperors of the sea. He also learned the true path to finding the One Piece, which was collecting the road poneglyphs, so that became a priority for all the future arcs. And of course, we also saw the evolution of his gear four forms with Boundman, Tankman, and Snakeman. And this also kind of continued a trend of his forms and attacks getting more and more serious looking. I mean, seriously, if you compare this to how his fights looked early on in the series, there is no doubt that Luffy looks a lot more hardcore. But Whole Cake Island also showed us the power of advanced forms of hockey as well with advanced observation, which again was just a first step because in Wano, he then took that to a whole new level with advanced armament and even advanced conquerors hockey. However, of course, nothing quite still compares to Luffy awakening his devil fruit with his newfound gear fifth transformation. And if you remember how I mentioned Luffy's forms getting more and more serious, well, this is a 100% complete reversal back to the original because with Gear 5, Luffy unlocked the most wacky fighting style anime has ever seen. And while we still don't fully understand the true scopes and limits of this power quite yet, it essentially is pure freedom for Luffy to fight however his imagination allows him to. Which of course brings us to Luffy taking down the Emperor Kaido and becoming a fully acknowledged Yonko in his very own rights. However, Luffy is still not 
done growing yet because with all of the power-ups growing as a captain and his presence on the world stage, he still very much needs to learn how to actually defeat the world government and free the world from their eternal evil rule. And to do that, he surely is going to need to take down the evil ruler Emu here, whose name will certainly be added to the very long list of characters that Luffy has defeated. And so if you want to see exactly all characters in the entire series that the Stride Captain has actually taken down so far, from his clashes with Empress all the way to characters that you probably forgot even existed, then you can watch that video right here. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, subscribe. I know it's kind of annoying to hear this, but it does really help out the channel. Otherwise, I hopefully will see you in the next one.